The Hindukush range lies between Afghanistan and northwest Pakistan. It has more than two dozen peaks higher than 7,000 meters and numerous 6,000 meters. Most of the 7,000 meter mountains lie in northwest Pakistan in the Afghan province of Badakhshan. At 7,708 meters, the Rishmir is the highest peak in the Hindu Kush and the highest mountain outside of the Himalaya and Karakoram. The other three highest mountains of Hindu Kush are Noshak, 7,492 meters, Estronal, 7,403 meters, and Saragar, 7,340 meters. The Rishmir is a massive of 11 peaks many of them higher than 7,000 meters. There is a main peak, an eastern peak reached by a ridge in the northwest rampart. There is a little wonder that there has grown up about the mountain. In the minds of those who live under its spell, a multitude of superstition and myth. The stories have been passed down from generation to generation and are believed by even the most enlightened people. It's said that the summit is in the form of a castle inhabited by fairies. They throw rocks and trigger avalanches on anyone venturing the mountain. In 1928-1929, officials from the Survey of India made an unsuccessful attempt to reach the high peaks suitable for triangulation around Trichmir. A German expedition in 1935 made an unsuccessful attempt to reach the summit from the south. In 1939, Smitten, Miller, and Richard Ogel, with some experienced surfers, attempted to reach Mir from the south of the Uyghur Glacier. They reached the southern ridge of the massive but continued no further. The south shoulder looked to them to be very steep and uncompromising. Moreover, they hadn't had sufficient rope and fittings to make a secure fixed roofway on the steep part of the route. On return to base camp, they were to hear the grave news of the outbreak of the Second World War in Europe, so had to give up any idea of further attempts at Richmere and return to England. After the war, climbers of several countries had their eyes on Richmere. But the Norwegians were the first to make definite plans for a reconnaissance in 1949 and a major assault in 1950. In 1949, two Norwegian climbers, Arne Randers Heen and Arne Naiz, made a reconnaissance of Trichmir. Trichmir had been strongly recommended to Arne Naiz by Eric Shepton and by Professor Morgan Stein. Norwegian specialist in Afghan and Kuwar languages. In Oslo, a major expedition sponsored by the Norwegian Alpine Club and the Norwegian Geographical Society was prepared during the winter of 1949-1950 to make an assault on Trichmir in the summer of 1950. The Norwegian party of 1950 was consisted of leader Anne Ease, 38, Hans Bug, 40, Henry Borg, 27, Ford Kornborg, 32, Lorenzen, 41, Expedition Doctor, and Tony Strader from Breton. Tony was a member of the Chetral State Scouts, whose knowledge of the area and its people was very important. The 40 reached base camp on the Borum Glacier on the 11th of June. The glacier is 15 kilometers long and leads to the south and southeast walls of Tirichmir. Over the following weeks, the team established an advance base camp near the top of the glacier at 5,400 meters. Avalanches hit their tent several times. After much difficulties, they began a summit push on the 20th of July. Despite deteriorating snow conditions, Kornborg went ahead alone, with the remaining members behind him. The following day, they all reached the summit ridge at 7,130 meters. It was loaded with deep snow. Naiz, Strether, 
in Borg spent the night in a snow cave in the high camp while Kevin Borg reached the summit on the 22nd of July. He became the first person to summit to reach Mir. The next day, on the 23rd of July, Nais, Strether, and Berg summited too. However, the first ascent from the north wasn't until 1967, when a Czech team reached the summit by that side. It's the normal route now to climb Trichmir. There were three expeditions to Trichmir in 1995. A Japanese expedition, a multinational expedition led by David Hamilton, and a South Korean expedition. Seven climbers from these three expeditions summited the mountain. They were Nozawai Ayuni, Japan, Iwazaki Hiroshi, Japan, Emamura Hirotaka, Japan, David Hamilton, UK, Grant Dixon, Australia, Chu Jung Young, South Korea, and Kim Jae Fu, South Korea. All followed the most popular line of SN, the 1967 Czech Northwest Ridge Route. The Japanese expedition was consisted of four members. They arrived at base camp on the 14th of June. Despite an initial period of unsettled weather, they climbed in a lightweight semi-alpine style, establishing caches of food and equipment at 5,500 meters, 6,200 meters, and 6,600 meters before returning to base camp on the 28th of June. After five days of rest, they made a five-day push from the base camp for the summit starting the 3rd of July. Nozawai Ayuni, Aiwazaki Hiroshi, and Emamura Hirotaka reached the summit at 3 p.m. on the 7th of July. A multinational team comprised of poor Britain, two Australian, and one Canadian arrived at base camp on the 24th of June. Extensive snow cover on the glacier in late June mean that skis could be used with ease to supply the first three camps. By the 8th of July, camps 1, 2, and 3 were stocked, but snow conditions had deteriorated and skis could no longer be used. A few days later, on the 15th of July, David, Grant, and Stephen climbed the Kulwa from Camp 3 to set up Camp 4 on the call. The Kulwa took them a whole day, fixing ropes on the typical chimney section and the section leading to it. By the time they reached the call, it was dark, cold, and a strong wind was blowing. A small tent was erected and the three of them huddled in it. The stove took longer than usual to melt water for their forged throats. It was well up to midnight before they collapsed into sleeping bags. They slept in and the sun was well up the next morning when they emerged from their tent. The position was spectacular. The tent was perched on a narrow coal at 7,200 meters below the steep pyramid of Trichmir West Peak. Slopes leading up towards the main peak of the rich mirror were on the opposite. The rugged ridges of the Afghan Hindu Kush stretched to the horizon westwards. To the north, rear the steep and much closer ridges of the Pakistani fort of the range. They spent the day resting at Camp 4. The following day dawned fine, clear, and still. David Hamilton, Grant Dixon, and Stephen Fuller began their summit push at about 7.20 a.m. just after the sun painted their surroundings orange. They moved up very slowly. At 7,350 meters, Stephen started to suffer the effects of altitude and returned to Camp 4. David and Grant carried on together. During their summit attempt, 
base came had radio contact with them every hour and followed their progress although they couldn't be seen. They had good communication with base came which was in direct line of sight even if it was some 16 kilometers away. They negotiated a horrible section of deep forward snow which took them three hours followed by a steep rocky section with old fax roofs. Finally, after 9 hours of hard climb, they reached the summit of Trishmir at 2.23 pm on the 17th of July 1995. Grand Dixon became the first and only Australian to summit Trishmir, the highest peak of Hindu Kush. They had spectacular views from the summit. The peaks of the Karakuram mark the far eastern horizon. To the north, the high summits of the Pamirs were visible beyond the Hindu Kush's other 7,000 meter summits. And below and to the west, the many ridges of the Afghan Hindu Kush. After enjoying the spectacular views from the summit, they descended to spend the night with Stephen at Camp 4. The descent to Camp 4 took them only three hours in contrast to the flooring 9 hours ascent. On the morning of the 20th of July, the second summit team of Jerry Goldsmith and Phil Wickens turned back at 7,350 meters due to the effects of altitude. All ropes, tents and equipment were removed from the mountain and the expedition members were all back in base camp by the 22nd of July. The eight members of the South Korean expedition led by Lee Hai Bong arrived in base camp on the 7th of July and set up camp. They attempted to compensate for the late arrival by long load carries of the Teres Glacier, exhausting both climbers in the three high altitude quarters they had retained. They quickly established camp 1 at 5,600 meters, camp 2 at 6,400 meters, and came 3 at 6,650 meters. Beyond this, momentum slowed. It was several weeks later at the third attempt that they succeeded in getting two members, Cho Jung Young and Kim Jai Fu, up the gully between Camp 3 and Camp 4. Eventually, they reached Camp 4. On the 23rd of July, with two members resting in Camp 4, the expedition leadership and base camp made the decision to bring forward the expedition's plan full of date from base camp. Expedition members were told to start removing equipment from the mountain and porters were asked to arrive at base camp in three days' time. The weather on the 24th of July was unsettled, with high winds and turbulent cloud formations. This caused Cho Jung Young and Kim Jai Fu and Kim Fu to delay the start of their intended summit bed until 10 am. Throughout the day, they progressed upward, maintaining radio contact with base Kim. By mid afternoon, they made repeated requests in broken English for road information from David Hamilton and base Kim. They took the same route while David provided advice over the radio. At 7.15 pm, they reported they were on the summit. The Koreans at base camp were jubilant and didn't appear to be worried by the fact that the fair had summited just before dark and still had the decent to do. No further communication was heard from Cho Jung Young and Kim Jai Fu again. The Koreans at base camp didn't bother to go and assess their fellow climbers leaving the two climbers up on the mountain would decide their fate. David Hamilton and his fellows found their attitude hard to believe. They didn't really know if they lacked competence or were simply careless. No attempt was made to send a rescue team or search party to ascertain the fate of the missing men. Members of other expeditions in the area expressed astonishment at the apparent inability of the Koreans to mount any rescue effort for their missing colleagues. Two days later, the Koreans left the base camp. 
A helicopter search eight days later found no trace of the missing men. They may have perished in a fall somewhere between summit and camp four, or they may have died somewhere below camp four while descending. Their bodies were never found. Thank you all so much for watching.